Have you ever wondered how some singers sail through higher frequencies with ease, grace, and almost otherworldly abilities? Have you told yourself they must have just come out of the womb singing like that, or singing just comes easy for some people? I've definitely asked myself those questions and asserted those opinions. So many skills of singing did not come easily for me. I had to fight for my technique through a lot of tears, groans and confusion and it's meant that my technique is a hard-won treasure that I never take for granted. It's also helped me be a better teacher because I know what it feels like showing up to practice every day not sure if the outcome I wanted so badly would ever materialize. Hey there, if you are new here, my name is Dan Calloway. I teach musical theater voice and vocal pedagogy at Boston Conservatory at Berkeley. 25 years plus working on equity stages and more than 15 years helping musical theater performers get to work on Broadway national tours regionally and around the world. This is the first in a series of videos in which I'm going to show you how you can, number one, today, understand how to sing high notes without strain in multiple styles. You're going to find out how the different systems of singing all work together in their specific roles. A lot of times, teachers may give you a trick that produces a quick result, but if you don't understand how things are interacting, you won't be able to adjust to differing styles, songs, and vocal requirements. So. That's going to be what we cover today. In subsequent videos, I'm going to share with you exercises that you can start using right away to balance and free your higher frequencies. I'll give you a clear checklist so you can troubleshoot breath, body use, and your own psychology when you're on your own. And you'll understand how some professional singers seem to execute higher notes effortlessly and how you can make sure that you're working in a sustainable way that nurtures your vocal health and increases your flexibility, strength, and confidence. When I began singing lessons as a teenager, my teacher, Mr. Beam, gave me a setting of an English poem by Roger Quilter, My Life's Delight. The song was not a delight to sing. It climbed past Middle Sea and basically stayed there pounding my voice on the jagged rocks of F's and G's. I can still remember singing it or attempting <laughs> to sing it for our studio recital in the First Presbyterian Church Fellowship Hall and thinking, please God, can this be over? Um, all the while thinking Jesse the baritone over there had it real easy with his mellow ranged Seben Crudele and Candy over there. She got to sing O Mio Babino Caro in her head voice. So if you're feeling unskilled and inept at anything, it's basic torture to have to execute it in front of folks before you're ready. In fact, experiences like this stop singers from moving forward with integrating their technique all the time. Not being able to access nascent technique while adrenalized in front of a crowd can turn into self-talk like, this just isn't available to me, or I'll never be able to do this in front of an audience, or that experience was so painful, I don't ever want to risk doing that again. It's a lot like math education. You find yourself knee deep in algebra one and you never quite understood how to execute order of operations in eighth grade math. So now you're trying to do quadratic equation homework and you can't even remember if you're supposed to add or multiply first. You missed some very foundational information and rather than going back to recover it and solidify your math knowledge, you just berate yourself for being bad at math. Singers do this all the time. You'll sing for years using the same understanding of support or tract shaping because someone said something you thought meant something else and you double down on unhelpful technique because you've already used it for so many years and it has to work for you one day, right? The good news is that smart folks, voice scientists keep learning more and more about how the voice functions and curious teachers keep trying new things and sharing their knowledge with each other. So there are a lot of tools for you to try out. If you keep doing helpful things for your voice, things will coordinate and the singer you will be, the singer you will become, 
won't even be recognizable to present day you. That is just the reality. If you do helpful coordinations, if you show up and do that consistently, your whole singer identity will change. And that's really great news. So hold on to that when you're in your frustrating moments. And side note, if you are someone like me, speaking of practicing and working, if you're someone like me who needs to know you're working really hard at things and thinks there's still maybe a secret report card for life somewhere that rewards doggedly diligent students, stay with me to find out how singing can be really offensive to all your ego needs and self-differentiation campaigns. It is an amazing and freeing journey that might make you a little angry in the process. I call good singing offensively easy, so I'll talk a little bit more about the mechanical ways that that occurs. So a primary question you're probably asking is, how do these pitches come out of my face in a beautiful and skilled way with multiple style options that doesn't make me feel like I just shoved a box grater down my throat? Great question. And it's one I've asked myself even after years of work on professional stages. When I was in my 30s, many colleagues encouraged me to re-engage my classical singing after hearing an aria that I included in a club act. I was very eager to return to some of the music my early training featured, but when I did, I realized I was super confused about the aesthetic differences between musical theater and classical styles, I apparently didn't even know what legato was, according to some coaches, and my breath support was all disconnected, which it was, but depending on who was assessing, very different muscle coordinations needed to be trained. So I was confused. I'd get to the end of an aria and I would slammed my folds together so hard through the middle ranges that by the time I got to climactic high notes, I was cooked. And then if there were any softer sections following that, I sounded like I'd contracted sudden onset laryngitis. I'd make sounds in coachings just trying to imitate what was modeled to me. And a coach would say, oh, you're singing great. And I think, what am I doing? Am I just holding my throat as open as I can and imitating Jonas Kaufmann? Is this a sustainable event? And my body would answer an emphatic no, I was working very hard in practice, both mentally and physically, and I didn't quite understand what all the tools I was trying were actually doing, leaving me confused and frustrated and lacking confidence in what to do to navigate transitional and higher frequencies. But before we talk about how to actually execute higher pitches with ease and balance, we really need to back it up. The way you do anything as a singer is how you do everything. If you sing notes in your middle voice with a lot of pressure and effort, you're going to sing higher and lower frequencies the same way. If you sing low C with too much dynamic support, you're going to be punching your high attempts with energy that overblows the whole coordination. So I think you might know what I am going to say next. Your higher notes are only going to function as well as the other coordinations of your voice. This is all pitches available to your physiology in the various modes that you can sing in. For more on this idea, I'll link a video in the description on how to increase your vocal range that covers a lot of these principles in greater depth. For the purposes of this video, I'll say you need to cultivate a balanced coordination of your air intake determining the amount of dynamic support you need for a particular phrase or vocal task, the mode you wish to sing in, and the aesthetic expression of the pitch that reflects the style you're singing and shares the emotional reality you're communicating. Singing is that many things, so that's why it's important to get one skill online and working in procedural memory and then connecting a new skill to that. For example, starting with letting your breath enter in an easy, quiet way, being aware of how your diaphragm contracts down and relaxes up, and getting used to a satisfied yet flexible feeling on inhales. Just your intake of air is a huge factor in how the vibrating air leaves when you sing. Then, when you begin to gain awareness of how you're breathing in, you can start to add the different coordinations of moving air out. 
and I'll link a group of three videos that talk about the basic principles of appoggio that will help you out here, as well as one that talks about other muscle groups in your torso that you can recruit for different styles and sounds. That'll be in the description for you as well if you want to explore breath further. So the burning question, what do you need to have working together to let higher notes come through with ease, balance, and confidence? The list is actually pretty long. Assuming you've got a good working command over your breath understanding, balanced and efficient vibration of your folds in mode one, often called chest, and mode two, often called head, a clear concept of how resonance functions, and the ability to use different parts of your vocal tract interdependently, then you're ready to employ some of these tools for allowing your voice to sail into higher frequencies. Using your middle easy range is the place to build awareness and skill with body use, breath management, vibrational economy, resonance awareness, and tract shaping and articulation. This is the only way that you're going to be able to employ these tools when your folds stretch longer for higher frequencies and have to balance with very particular and calibrated deliveries of air pressure, vowel changes to support consistent registration if that's your intention on a certain phrase. So please raise your hand and I will raise it with you and affirm to yourself that you understand that high notes live along with an entire ecosystem of balanced, organized vocalism that makes all kinds of sounds in all kinds of ranges. If you focus your attention and practice on high notes alone, you'll be kind of like a dancer who cultivates super flexible hamstrings while neglecting their quads. So just like an athlete trains a balanced body tuned to their particular sport, you are a vocal athlete and your whole body needs to train for physical, emotional, and spiritual balance. Okay, here we go. Here are the things you need to check if you're struggling with higher notes. Number one is your body use. Where is your skeleton in space? In musical theater, folks hit high notes in all kinds of physical configurations. So what you need to know is, how can my body be in a neighborhood that promotes easy and flexible movement of torso muscles that provide air through an optimally resonant vocal tract. A general posture lineup check looks like this, and from this understanding, you can adjust to almost any place. If you're singing, you're moving, and you are capable of singing while moving in all kinds of different ways. If you have the luxury of letting your feet be under your hips, you might be, you know, lying on a table or hanging from a scaffold, but if you have the luxury of letting your feet be under your hips, put them there, yeah? Line them up right under your hip bones. Slightly front, slightly back, side by side, it depends on your body. Experiment to see what feels best for your skeleton. You wanna soften your knees. I say like room temperature butter. Your legs should have a sense of spring to them, and these soft knees will affect where your pelvis is. If you lock your knees, the back of your pelvis will crunch up toward the bottom of your ribs, and that will cut off flexible movement when the diaphragm descends to expand your lungs. Give your pelvis some attention. See it as a mirror relating to the downward bowl of your rib cage. You wanna see your spine and your soft little kid belly between the two. Your ribs float above your pelvis. Your shoulders get to be soft your sternum open-hearted. Move your attention up your spine and note where your skull tilts, sitting on the top of your spine. Give your neck and shoulders soft, loving attention. Check your jaw, your chewing muscles and tongue. Let them soften and let your ears float over your shoulders. This is big. For most folks, ears over your shoulders will feel like your head's gonna fall off the back of your body. For many reasons, and you know them all, our head and neck posture juts and collapses forward. This is a huge inhibitor for resonance and ease when you're singing. If you picture that your larynx and pharynx line up inside this skeletal relationship, you can already see what a forward jut or protrusion might do. You can even feel the energetic strain in that. 
Imagine taking a garden hose and jerking it forward like that. That will impede and overpressurize the water flowing through, and it's the same with your air. Ears floating over your shoulders, that's the neighborhood you want. And I heard the term neighborhood from a terrific Alexander teacher in Los Angeles, and I find that so helpful. It's a zone in which you can move rather than a rigid posture you feel like you have to maintain. Then the top of your skull, noticing the energy that lives there. Then just send a waterfall of attention right back down through your body. You can accomplish a body scan like this in seconds. You can just keep sweeping down, sweeping up. And just noticing parts in your body that need a little TLC. Notice how quickly your awareness moves. And as you sing, your awareness of your body in space is going to be crucial. You can notice your abs have locked and know that a softening of your knees and a release of your pelvis will help things release and balance. So it's an ongoing attention and adjustment as you're doing the thing. Now let's address your neck and head as a particular culprit for higher pitch distress and general singing inefficiency. Take a moment to think about how you conceive of the movement of your voice. Your mouth is on the front of you, you know, and we often intend for our voices to be heard at a certain distance in front of us. This sets up a very logical, though unhelpful, image of needing to send or direct the voice to a certain location many feet away, maybe the back of a theater. This can often recruit muscles to help this forward idea by jutting the head forward. Perhaps thinking that moving my mouth four inches closer to my voice's intended destination will help it along in some way. That's what our brain does. Our body has its own logic and it's always trying to help. That's crucial. When you're running into something that feels like an inhibitor or something that's in your way, always meet the body with curiosity and see in what way it might be trying to help you. Then you're going to be able to work with the systems of the body in a logical and compassionate way, which is going to be a lot faster than yelling at yourself. The physiological reality is that your folds vibrate in your larynx and the vast majority of amplification and resonance take place in the pharynx. That is the tube that runs from your larynx all the way to the end of your nose. If you snort, you can feel where part of it is, where your uvula flops back against the back wall there. That's your pharynx and that's where the grand majority of your resonant magic happens. If you take care of what's going on there, physics will take care of the rest of what's going on in the air molecules around you. Also remember that your voice vibrations send out sound waves in a sphere. You can observe your voice moving in all kinds of directions and different attentions are going to yield different benefits depending on the singer and what you're singing. So this very logical yet unhelpful assistance the body tries to provide by jutting your head forward squeezes and inhibits the ability to create free and helpful resonance and amplification of sound waves. Return to the idea of your ears floating over your shoulders. You can practice this by leaning the top of your back against a wall and letting your head rest there against the wall. I guess I have to show you, right? All right, so see me against the door. I'm way back, back here. Yeah. I'm just going to lean against this door. And my bottom comes out. My back is here. And then I can let my head rest against the door. But this is what I'm talking about. Just a gentle lean. And then you can just let the wall take your weight. So again, you're going to practice by leaning the top of your back against the wall and letting your head rest there. You'll feel the tendency to jump forward. And you can just use this to habituate this new alignment. And it also brings awareness to how you carry your body in everyday life. And I bet you, a frozen yogurt, that you'll notice some changes in your energy flow and interaction with people when you start to think about how your head lines up over your shoulders. Some teachers will tell you not to look up or to keep your chin down when you sing, especially high notes. But the thing you need to be aware of is the forward jut. You can totally turn your head upward on the axis of the AO, Atlanta occipital, occipital joint, and make super free sounds as long as your chewing muscles are nice and soft. I mean, think about a coyote makes high pitches with its head up all the time. So, in fact, this movement is a terrific way to encourage the release of your pharynx. 
so that you can feel maximal resonant space. And I will show you that in the exercise video that I'll make for you later. So awareness of your skeleton in space, that's consideration number one. Is your body coordinating in a way that produces flexible, free sound? The next big question to ask yourself is one I've talked about in a few other videos, which are also linked in the description. How much air do you need to sing a particular phrase? And then how much dynamic support do you need to sing the phrase? You want to go phrase by phrase and ask your body, how much air does this phrase need? And most of the time, we think we need more than we actually do. And we overfill and we set up way too much air pressure below the folds. So listen to what your body says and experiment with that amount. Then ask your body, how much muscular engagement do you need either in the abdominal family or ribs to sing the phrase the way you want to sing it. Again, I'll link a more detailed video about breath management in the description that you can check out and absorb those steps. Listen to what your body says and experiment with that amount. Then ask your body, once you've taken in the air, how much muscular engagement you need, either in the abdominal family or ribs, depending on style, depending on sound, to sing the phrase you want to sing. And again, I will link those breath videos in the description that talk more about the actual mechanics of letting air in and moving air out. Along with your dynamic support question, you're going to need to determine what mode of singing you're in. Are you in mode one, which is often called chest voice, and in what iteration of that? Or mode two, which is often referred to as head voice, and what particular coordination of that? There are literally thousands of sounds that live inside the classifications of mode one or mode two. And if you're a theater singer, you're embodying all kinds of different people and sounds. That's what makes musical theater multifaceted and continually interesting. But singing a C5, well, kind of loud, but singing, the boys have probably been playing with the keyboard here, um, but singing a C5 in mode two is going to ask for a different kind of support than singing the same pitch in mode one. So it's, I'm doing this early in the morning because I don't know if this will come out. We'll see. If I go, those are going to be two different events or, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, so then they are going to ask for different kinds of support. Very different vocal events going on there, all in the same frequency. And then all kinds of other considerations come into play depending on the style. So you're going to ask yourself what kind of coordination is happening in the larynx. For mode two, you're looking at an event where the folds are given freedom to stretch right out and thinner edges of the mechanism are vibrating. So the sound quality may be what we describe as thinner, lighter, more of a neutral event. And then mode two has all kinds of options. I can go Western classical. Something like that. If I can go uh, semi-breathy or poppy. I don't know if I can do this this morning. Let's see. Hey. Okay. Here you go. Hey. All right. That's the sound you can make, right? <laughs> I can go um, Frankie Valley, right? Oh, what, what key is that? So that sort of feeling, those are all in mode two, I can go into more of a head dominant mix. Hey! That kind of sound, okay? That's all mode two. They're all living there and they're all gonna need different breath coordinations depending on the phrase, the impulse, volume, the intention of the communication. All of that will affect what's going on in the larynx on mode two. For mode one, mode one, you are looking at an event in which the actual body of the vocal folds engage and provide more vibrating tissue to the frequency. Your vocal folds, your vocal folds are isometric tensors, and that means they can contract without shortening. So you can sing this, I think it's a G4. I always have to like count the 
the, the, the notes. This G4 in mode two, ah, and then you can see it in mode one. Ah. So the length of your folds stretch to that G4 length, but when you engage the body of the folds, the vibration character changes because you've added more meat to the situation. So this is often why we feel a muscular risk when higher notes happen in mode one, because we can feel the balancing of the muscles that stretch the folds longer and the muscles that increase the amount of body. This is also where singers get tripped up because as you increase frequency, the folds do have to stretch and thin. If you're trying to apply the same feeling of thickness you feel on like G3, the G3, yeah, G3 to what you feel on G4, you will be inhibiting the natural function of the larynx and forcing a thick fold idea that weighs down your communication rather than setting it free. So, I mean, if I'm like, ah, if I feel that sort of robustness and I try to translate that feeling, ah, and I try to replicate that here, ah, I mean, I can do the pitch, but I can feel a little bit of inhibiting on it where letting the larynx really free up ah, can help it help it to calibrate for a different frequency. It's a different coordination. So like I said, you'll be inhibiting the natural function of the larynx and forcing a thick fold idea that weighs down your communication rather than setting it free. So I say this all the time, singing is a chance for you to collaborate with your body the way it functions as far as we can understand it through observation and evidence. If you're insisting on giving that G here, the same amount of vocal fold engagement as the G4, you may be able to get the sound out, but most people hearing you are gonna be feeling quite tense and perhaps shouted at. And that could be a goal of the sound in a certain moment. So all the sounds are useful. I mean, you, you might really intentionally want to make a shouty sound here that's appropriate for character and story. So remember, all sounds are on the table as long as they are going to be agreeing with your stylistic world, the narrative of, the story you're telling, etc. And while we're visiting your larynx, I want you to take a moment to thank this miraculous structure. Not only does it allow for the passage of air in and out of your lungs, while also ensuring food and water go where they belong, but it has an intelligence all its own when you sing. You want to endow the larynx with freedom to move where it instinctively wants to. You can cultivate this freedom through lots of different exercises. There's one series you can grab below in the description that helps develop registration, flexibility, and connection. But for our purposes for singing higher notes, I am an advocate of letting the larynx naturally elevate along with the pitch. As the folds stretch, the larynx likes to rock and naturally elevates a little. I think of it as a buoy on the water, floating and responding to the air pressure underneath. So a gently raising larynx also shortens the pharynx and can tune and amplify higher frequencies well. You know how a clarinet has that tricky spot in its range or in its scale that always wants to crackle or squeak? That's because the clarinet can only be one shape. The player has to navigate that through airflow and finesse. Singers are lucky because we can actually change the shape of the instrument to collaborate with the different frequencies we sing. So I say use that to your advantage. I talk more about this in the video I made about increasing your overall range for musical theater. All right. We've traveled from your overall body configuration. We've explored what your inhale looks like, how you want to dynamically support your sound, and what registration or mode and style or expression you're singing in, as well as honoring the brilliance of your larynx. Now we're gonna move to the next stop of your vibratory stream, and that is your main resonator, that is your pharynx. So if you snort a little, there where your uvula flops back, that is the back of your pharynx. That is the recital hall in your head, and it is the site of the vast majority of resonance and sound wave amplification for your voice. Your pharynx is made up of a series of three muscle groups called constrictors, and their muscular function does one thing. As you can surmise from their names, they constrict. 
If you swallow, you will feel their brilliant activity. You do this hundreds of times a day, so your pharyngeal muscles are used to this squeezy job. When you sing, they have to learn a more versatile role. Remember how I talked about the logical image of the voice moving somewhere out in front of you? So the cells in your pharynx often believe this story too. So when they realize you want your voice to travel forward, they're like, oh, okay, let me help you. We'll give your voice a push. And remember, the only thing they can do is squeeze and make the tube smaller. So this is often the opposite of what we want for free and efficient resonance. Most of the time, we want the pharyngeal muscles to be soft and melted in order to provide the voice ample room to amplify. And this feels super weird. In fact, it is one of my foundational tenets of singing, that singing is weird. It feels so strange because you're moving energized, emotionally charged vibration through your pharynx that you are training to relax. And this doesn't happen in life. It would be very strange to hear me shout at somebody, uh, look out for the bus, or you've made me so angry. You know, like try to get through <laughs> something that's very intensely emotional through a very relaxed pharynx our body automatically will grab on to emotional energy just as, a, as an instinct. So that's why singing is an art form that we train because we're training muscle groups to do things that we don't naturally do with our human instinct. That's why singing feels so unfamiliar and illogical compared to the way that we've always expressed ourselves. So what we want to do is to become able to manage the levels of constriction, to be aware of them and able to engage and release different degrees of constriction or softening. Because you're going to use all kinds of configurations in your vocal tract and some forms and locations of constriction will be quite inhibiting while others will be very helpful. Constriction is useful for intentionally breathy neutral sounds. So if you're crooning like, someday, when I'm awfully low. That requires some whispery constriction. It's very gentle, but there's some constriction involved on that. Or if you're in mode two and you want to add some breathy quality that requires constriction. So, I don't know. <laughs> I always feel silly doing this. If you, oh, hey, those, those kinds of sounds that I demoed earlier. You can feel it yourself if you just whisper. So pay attention to your pharynx and notice that it's constricted. There will also be other styles where you'll calibrate some constriction for effect. If you think about rock sounds, sort of like that, ooh, that hurts so good kind of sound, like, ooh, ooh, that employs some level of constriction. Or if I'm in my, I'm thinking still like 80s rock feels like, um, Cheap Trick, uh, what is that song? The Flame, that comes to my mind right now. So if it's like, um, I don't know. Whenever you need someone. So that sort of little bit, tiny bit of distortion, tiny bit of um, getting in the way of the sound waves in my vocal tract, that requires some levels of constriction in some places. So you always want to investigate and return to the emotional source of why that constriction is happening? What am I believing and feeling that creates that energy and that vocal tract setup? All right, your vocal tract shape exists inside of a whole emotional energetic framework, a whole emotional and energetic body. And if you employ twang in your sound, which we normally do, there's constriction that brings the epiglottis and arytenoids close together just above the fold. So if I sing, hey, really open, there's not a lot of constriction there, but if I twang that vowel, ay, 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 I've brought the lower part of my pharynx closer together. The inferior constrictor has brought my epiglottis and arytenoids closer together. This is where a lot of people get mixed up with twang because they're not differentiating the different levels of constrictors. They're bringing the epiglottis and arytenoids closer but they're also constricting the rest of the pharynx. And that's what causes strain, squeeze, and discomfort. So this is when it's important to remember that this is a deliberate and systematic building and coordination of a lot of systems. If you can respect how complex singing can be, 
you can give yourself a break when you feel like different parts of your body aren't talking to each other yet. It takes time to coordinate and get them all communicating. Now, when you're able to let the pharynx soften and allow therapeutic vibration through, you've experienced what I like to call offensively easy singing. You've softened the channel, your vibration flows through, and it feels easier than anything in your hardworking life has had any business feeling before. If you are an earner, you're like me, and you feel like you need to just earn and deserve things, you will feel like you're cheating. Or you'll ask, is it okay for this to feel this effortless? And the answer to that is a resounding yes. And when people hear you sing and your freedom and your ease hits their ears, it helps them to feel free. And they'll thank you for that gift. I also say that the more that we let these inhibitors melt and relax, the more authentic you can come through. The more that you can allow something like the pharynx to really soften and let your voice naturally vibrate through, the colors of you just naturally emerge. And it's it's a really magical thing when, when people start to let that through because there's only one one vocal pattern that is yours. And so what we're doing is you're letting that natural thing that you showed up on the planet with emerge. So that's that's what I call offensively easy singing because it offends our ego that wants to work hard. You feel the grace in it. You feel the gift in it. You feel that, oh, wow, I have this ability to take a free inhale of air and then I turn that air into music. I, I think it's pretty astounding and I never... I'm never, I'm never not moved by that. So that's attention toward what your pharynx is doing and how you can manage the constriction that happens there. And I'll give you a few exercises that will help you gain awareness of what's going on in there and command over how much you do or don't constrict in the exercise video that I'm going to make for you. Along your vocal tract journey, you need to keep an eye out for a few other culprits in vocal disruption. And I'll tell you what those are. One is the movement of your jaw. You want to make sure that you're letting your jaw open along its natural path. And that's gently down and back. So if you pretend to fall asleep on a plane or a bus, you can feel this natural movement. Sometimes singers will want to protrude the jaw forward. And it may feel like when you do that, it may feel like you're providing stability to the voice. And you also might be getting a little more bone conductivity from the jaw moving right under the eardrum, giving you the sense of increased resonance, although you're actually compromising resonance space when you do that. Even in more engaged mouth openings, like if I'm you want to make sure that the jaw lowers gently down and back in its natural path. The other spot you want to check on are your lips because you're moving, again, like I said, you're moving all kinds of emotional vibration through you. Muscle groups of all kinds are going to want to hold on and help you manage that energy. So your lips are the last line of affective defense here. And sometimes, and that, what I mean by that is the muscles that are trying to manage or hold on to this emotional energy that's coming through you. So sometimes you might notice some tightening in the lip muscles or the muscles around the mouth. And if you do, just give them a little massage while you sing and see if that loosens things up. So when the muscles around the lips grab on, they can send a domino effect of tension all the way down into the clavicle and the upper body in this area. So note that your jaw, the opening of the jaw and lips and mouth. So we have stacked body use, breath intake, vibrating outflow, type of phonation and registration, managed pharyngeal tension and paid attention to the movement of the jaw and the muscular engagements of the lips and mouth. The next considerations you're going to focus on are in the other shapings of your vocal tract. Where is your soft palate and what's going on with your tongue? The soft palate can be any place you decide it needs to be to execute the sound you want to make. Uh, if it's low and the nose is open, you get a nasal sound and that's right for something. Some people talk like this. And if you loft it high, you're going to get a rounder tone with decreased air and acoustic pressure. So that's a rounder tone you're going to get. 
And if it's in a medium neighborhood, you're gonna get a balance of bright and dark speech-like quality, probably. Your palette location is gonna depend a lot on the style you're singing and the sounds you want to make. So that's very variable. And there's the matter of your tongue, your vowel choice, specifically meaning where your tongue relates to your hard palate will factor in substantially to the success of certain pitches in certain modes. That's another video, but if you want to check out Complete Vocal Techniques research on vowels and modes, it gives you a lot of good information, so give that a Google. And I'll also link another video in the description about the vowels you can always depend on. That's mostly for mode one singing, but the vowels that I like to use, especially in higher mode one pitches. Here's my general rule for the tongue though, and this will be a big deal as you organize your voice more and more and become more confident in your consistency with balancing all the frequencies you sing. Look how huge it is. It is pretty massive. So what I want for me when I sing is to float my tongue higher toward my hard palate as much as I can. I like to let my tongue fill the oral cavity as much as it wants to. This accomplishes at least three things. Number one, it floats the root of the tongue away from my larynx, which gives it freedom to move where it wants. Number two, it also glides the tongue out of my pharynx, which as you just learned is your most resonant chamber. So it frees that up for resonant magic. And it also brings the top of your tongue, number three, the dorsum high toward the hard palate. And that creates a terrific acoustic bottleneck that produces all kinds of favorable amplification and efficiency advantages. Often singers will press their tongues low and out of, or they think out of the way, thinking they need to create space in the mouth. Now you can create space in the mouth. It is a place where resonance occurs, but you need to be cognizant of how that's affecting other parts of your tract. For me, letting the tongue float up and into my mouth is 98% of the time the way I want to go. Or I like the phrase that Mike Ruckles in New York uses. He, he says, puddled forward. I like that. I let the tongue puddle forward. I like that imagery. It's a good, it's a good verb, puddled. So let's go back in reverse to touch on each interdependent part we just covered. Your tongue is floating gently up away from your larynx and can fill the mouth. Your soft palate will be in all manner of configurations depending on the style you're singing. Your pharynx has a multitude of constriction and release options that you can leverage in many ways. Your larynx is given freedom to move as it intuits what the air pressure below and the frequency and mode your folds are singing. You have a sense of how your folds produce pitch and you're getting more and more familiar and organized about what mode you're in and when. Mode one is often referred to as chest and mode two is often referred to as head. You've asked your body how much dynamic support the phrase you're singing needs, and you also ask your body how much air do you need to inhale to sing the phrase. You're aware and conscious of your body and space, and you can dynamically align your skeleton to meet the demands of the song you're singing in the role you're playing. No big deal, right? I'm intentionally relisting all these components for two reasons. One is for your own review, and the other is to remind you how many nuanced systems have to cooperate for singing to happen. It is great to have a mystified respect for how it all figures itself out while keeping a sense of simplicity and fundamentals as you master them. And if you pay attention to these aspects in what you'd call your middle voice, the pitches you can sing any day, any time, the range you would choose to sing happy birthday in, then these principles will apply to and support your movement into higher frequencies. Different singers coordinate different things at different times. The standard you need to look at is, where are you compared to where you were a month ago, a year ago? Keep working with these tools and they will integrate over time and always pause and look at your progress on your path. In the next video in this series, I'll give you specific exercises and strategies you can use right away to start coordinating these skills from body use to tract shape. For now, save this video and percolate on all these different elements that happen in progression and time. 
just your awareness of how these systems interact is going to change how you approach your singing and you'll begin to have some of those offensively easy moments jump up and surprise you. And if you have something that's specifically bothering you or an issue that you're like, I just, I feel really stuck on this. Tell me in the comments because if you let me know what's going on with you, what you're having challenges with, I can craft the, the exercise video to address those things specifically. So I can help you out specifically. So just tell me in the comments what, what specific issues you're running into as far as accessing higher frequencies, as far as the balance in your voice or anything that came up in your brain as I talk through these principles. Let me know and I can, I can help you out. There is an exercise framework that I've already created if you wanna jump on this today. This one is specifically tailored for registration flexibility, but the principles in it are all going to support you in trusting and singing higher notes with freedom and confidence. So you can get that in the description and you'll also get weekly emails from me with helpful tools and lessons extracted for your benefit from my own foibles and failures. So why make mistakes when you can learn from mine, all right? And if you're feeling like you could use some more foundational tools and understanding for adding stretch and flexibility to your overall vocal range, and what a wise goal to have, we all want flexibility, you can go to this video I'll share on the screen on how to increase your vocal range for musical theater. Because remember, range encompasses high, low, and middle frequencies. And most importantly, please, please remember, there is only one you, and somebody needs to hear the story that only you can sing. So, love much, and now, go sing.